All right, hello and welcome to the Steam Power Podcast, number 44. Um, coming back from a little vacation or workcation uh, up in Washington, D.C. So I was out last week, um, too busy packing and getting ready. So we're back, though, for this week. And um, got a lot of stories, a lot of news happened in the last week and a half, two weeks for... Uh, for technology enthusiasts, so we'll cover all those. Just making sure all my settings here look good. Okay, so um, I guess we should go ahead and uh, well, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Let's see if all this is working. I am uh, took the plunge in and running the beta of Yosemite and iOS 8, so. Um, so far, so good. Not a huge change compared to um, uh, at least on the iPhone, the iOS side. Going from iOS six to iOS seven, it's not as big as a change as that. Um, but um, some some good tweaks overall. I'm trying to see if my apps that I'm writing um, work, and that's why I took the plunge. Um, I think if you're just interested in trying it out, I think probably wait another two or right now they just came out with the uh, beta two, so they had the initial release at WWDC, then they've released it an update since then for both Yosemite and iOS. Um, I'd say probably wait till the the third update. So I don't know if they would consider that. The, if they're calling it update one, update two, update three now, so it's iOS beta update one. So I'd wait at least until probably beta three. We'll see. Um, I've had some quirks when I was up in DC last week with the, like the camera app and Facebook and trying to post pictures and whatnot. Um, it worked. I had to reset the phone a couple times though, so um, not bad. It, it's not, it's definitely usable. Um, but if you're expecting that nice, smooth operation, um, don't, don't upgrade. Uh, the other neat thing is that, that you know has been coming. I don't know if this is something that existed before iOS 8, but at least I've seen it more, or at least I've never seen it before iOS 8. Um, if your phone's been off for a little bit and you you know hit the home button to fire it back up, if there's any apps that have been running in the background using your location data, um, it gives you a little pop-up that says, hey, like for here, it says Swarm has been using your location in the background. Do you want to continue to allowing this? And then there's don't allow or continue. Um, curious if it also does like data, like you know, this particular app has been using a lot of data in the background. Do you want to continue? I haven't seen that yet, but uh, anyway, um, they're, they're decent upgrades, but like I said, um, I'd hold off. Uh, at least till another two two iterations come through, I think then they'll have cracked a lot of the uh, the bugs. At least that was my experience with iOS seven. I think they went through at least three, four betas, four or five betas, um, and around the third when it started to be uh, usable again. All right. Anyway, let's go ahead and. Uh, Start by thanking our sponsor for this week. So this week, uh, as always, we are brought to you by Audible.com. You can... Oops, what did I do there? Uh, uh, did I do anything? Or did I not do anything? So anyway, um, head on over to audibletrial.com slash steampowerpodcasts and you can sign up for a free 30-day trial that gets you... Um, uh, one free download, and um, or one credit, and then you can download a, a book with that credit. Uh, and then if you sign up, it's um, one credit a month, which is basically uh, basically one one book a month just for the uh, the trial. And uh, it's fourteen ninety five a month after that. And uh, I think they've got this is here over one hundred fifty thousand audio books. So 
Obviously, if you're listening to this podcast, if you're not watching the YouTube stream, you're a podcast listener, and you probably, like me, do a lot of commuting, a lot of traveling. Um, when you've gone through all your podcasts, um, or if you want to switch from, I guess podcasts tend to be nonfiction, and if you're looking for some fiction, some entertainment, uh, Audible is a good fix for your uh Ears, your audio entertainment. Entertainment for your ears. Anyway, uh, we thank Audible for their sponsorship of the Steam Power podcast and um, encourage you to go check them out if you haven't already. Okay, so with that, let's head on over. Let me, um, I'm going to start this week with my new little doohickey or gadget. So, picked up this from Adafruit.com, and we'll do the I get the website up here too, but just to give you some scale, it's called the uh, Charger Charger Doctor, not Charge Doctor Charger Doctor, and basically um, USB. Uh, basically, you plug in a USB device. And you can monitor how much power it's drawing. So for me, for instance, I was curious how much my Raspberry Pi was, uh, how much power that was sucking down. So we took the the little USB power brick, and instead of plugging the USB cable right in, I go ahead and plug the charge doctor in first, like so. Plug that into the AC outlet, and then plug the USB cable uh, that goes from the charge doctor into the Pi, and then you basically have this little. Um, there's four. Uh, yeah, is it four? Yeah, four of the seven segment little LEDs here. So you get um, it alternates every couple seconds between the current draw and the voltage. Um, and just let you know how much power, and if you monitor that over an hour, you kind of get the uh, how much energy you're consuming. So I'm actually thinking about maybe ripping it open and um, seeing if somehow I can uh, uh, do some sort of data logging with it. Maybe something send it something back to the Pi, and let it do some sort of data storage. Anyway, let me. Um, it's like eight bucks. Let's swap on over here. Yeah. So there you go. It's eight bucks, seven fifty on uh, Adafruit.com. And uh, like I said, it's. I like it because it's it's um, most curious, and. Uh, this makes it really darn easy to just sit there and uh, monitor your power usage. So for uh, yeah, you after you've designed a circuit, you power it up, and um, you can kind of get a feel for you know how fast you know base how fast will the battery die. Um, probably do a whole subject on that. I've I've recorded two videos on power consumption or parts of the video. Um, maybe that'll be an interesting video by itself. Um, yeah, make a note for myself. Anyway, uh, if you want to pick yours up, again, I don't know if there's anywhere else you can pick it up, but uh, 750 is not a less than a less than a subway meal. Anyway, all right, so with that, let's go ahead and uh, hop into the stories for this week. So the first week, uh, first news story for the week, um, some research into the brain and free will, and um, there's some th research into, you know, what is free will, how does it, what, what causes it, and there's a, a study out that says that basically free will could be the result of background noise uh, in the brain. So we're all, if you're a hand radio operator 
or if you've ever listened to the radio, you're very you're very aware of what background noise is. Um, you know that white noise that you hear because there's just a bunch of electromagnetic radiation always around us, and um, when you're not, when you're not tuned into a channel, that's all the noise you're hearing. So um, something along that lines, basically, that the brain's electrical activity when it's you're not really thinking about anything, it's just kind of in that idle mode. Um, that basically um, the background noise for certain decisions kind of um, you know makes it random and then the idea is if you can monitor um, that noise then you can kind of predict the outcome of the decision that's what they say and then I question okay so if I can sit there and monitor the the background this noise that's going on in this activity um, then if I therefore I can and then I can predict what the outcome will be um, do you really have free will is there really free will um, certainly there's maybe there's random will not free will um, I don't know. It's an interesting story. Um, and it comes. Uh, who did the research here? J Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience reported the group of researchers from the Center for Mind and Brain at the University of California, Davis. Um, anyway, so kind of you know. Is, is free will, is autonomous choices just an illusion, is what they ask. Um, certainly, I think if you can predict the outcome given certain sensor, you know, monitoring certain values, and when is, so when is the decision made? Like, mm, that's, it's a tough one. Because now that I know that they're monitoring, if they hook me up and they, I know that they're monitoring me, and I'm thinking about a decision, but the last second I decide, you know, I'm thinking about it, you know, basically if I'm going to go left or right, if I think I'm going left, the last possible second I change right, do they notice that flip at the last second and can predict? I don't know. Anyway, let me know what you think. Check out the article. Um, pretty cool. All right, so really the big story I wanted to start with, I got my little, uh, I guess I got my tabs backwards there, is uh, finally some some good news coming out of the U.S. Supreme Court um, as they start to strike down software patents. So um, this was a, the, this ruling here this last week, uh, Alice versus CLS Bank, um, basically... The idea of the, the whole ruling is, uh, and this was a particularly a banking um, algorithm that kind of detected risk during closing, um, and therefore it helps with the closing and avoiding uh, settlement risk in financial transactions. So that's this particular implementation. But the bigger context is that, um, and it kind of reaffirms what U.S. patent law should have always been, which is abstract ideas can't be patented. Um, back in the mid-90s, though, um, the first software patents got uh, issued and has been in a steady um, decline since then in the quality of the patents. Uh, and this computer engineer's professional opinion um, they are so darn vague that some of these these software patents should have never been issued, uh, even with the given uh, criteria. But now we have a Supreme Court decision um, that will hopefully um, force the Patent and Trade Office, uh, as well as lower courts that are pending any other litigation, um, to start invalidating patents that are basically ideas, and that you can't simply patented an abstract idea, uh, an algorithm, um, especially for like, things that are just mind-bogglingly, like, you know, you don't have to be an engineer to really know that, like, for me, one of the ones that gets me is the Amazon one-click buying 
patent that, you know, okay, so I click a button and because you've saved my banking, my credit card information, um, I can automatically make the purchase. Now, there's, you can't tell me that it only had to be an engineer or a computer scientist to come with that idea. That any layman would have said, oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, and that idea is, is so blatantly abs, you know, that it's it's not a patentable idea, and therefore, you know, you know, Amazon holds that patent, and anybody who does anything similar um, would have to basically license that technology, quote unquote, technology from Amazon. It's just ridiculous. And um, basically, you know, a lot of people, myself included, you know, all this patent troll, it does. It costs it costs us a lot of money. It costs us a lot of money, and and businesses have to pay license fees over stupid patents, which means they can't put more money into R and D. Um, and then, of course, as a taxpayer, we have so many of these these uh, court cases being heard in all our courts, wasting taxpayers' dollars. So hopefully, um, hopefully, this starts a. Uh, a reckoning of the patent troll and um, puts um, you know puts back the focus on true innovation and not friggin just suing um, you know hoping that you make more money there, there's some businesses even the big boys that make more money suing people and then you know settling um, than they would have a had they actually gotten the uh, you know a legitimate patent, or B, um, you know, had actually taken the time to innovate themselves. You know, basically, I'm I'm a big believer of the free and open capitalist markets, but you know, um, big business I don't think shares that. I think that they really do look for um, you know handouts in a different sense than most people think of them, but they look for protection from the government to as an excuse for not innovating. Um, and you know there are certain things that should be patented. There are certain breakthrough technologies, but software is such a um, you know I understand the, the argument about trademark or copywriting software versus that concept versus patented. Because so much of the ideas, um, you know, an algorithm, it, it's, a, it's an idea, it's, a, it's something that you, you conceptualize. And I get that, okay, if I code it in a certain language and in a very certain way, but there are many ways to get to that same end state. Um, Different coding mechanisms, and and your patent, your your patent for a general idea, um, is should not be it should not be patentable. Um, perhaps the particular implementation, uh, yes, but if you know anything about computers, you know there's 55 you know different ways to code to the same solution, um, and you know if I just put my if I even you know add a for loop in a different place or call my variable a different name. Um, you know, is that different code? Is that a different implementation? I think so. Um, and that's why I think just the whole idea of software being patented is, is just is crazy. Um, you have too many non-technical people, a, a, in the patenting of it, you've got too many non-technical people, especially... Um, once it if it does get issued and then you litigate, um, you know, too many non-technical people in the, in the legal profession um, for it for it to be doped up. Um, and then there's too much just money. There's too much greed involved um, to make you know basically get rich schemes. If I buy a patent portfolio, never intend to use it. To actually make a product, but just simply to sue people to make money, it's wrong. It's not what the patent, um, the, the the idea of a, the patent protection. I think, you know, this is why I commend Tesla for, you know, yeah, they patented, they protected themselves. Um, they really protected, I think, uh, the uh, other companies. Actually, I think it's kind of funny that um, we're going to see now a breakthrough 
in the electric vehicle market. Um, because yes, Tesla did go forth. They sought the patent that gives them now the ability to license it out, and they've decided to do so at no charge. Um, you know, now the cynic in me says, yeah, very, very easily they could. I guess I don't know. What, I guess if, if once you've licensed it for free, can you ever rescind the free and and enforce people to pay? I don't think so. But um. Anyway, we're digressing here. So kudos to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, software patents that, that cover abstract ideas cannot be uh, patented, and, uh, and anything that has been issued has been revoked. And uh, hopefully this starts um, killing the whole uh, software patent troll industry. Um, because it's, it's really, it does, it, kill, it is killing innovation. Anyway, and the rant. Okay, so speaking of electric vehicles, Harley Davidson has introduced their first electric motorcycle. Um, obviously, it's not meant to be a consumer product at this point. It's meant to be, um, and they even say it's not even it's not even a test bed for the technology. The technology is there; it's proven. Um, but they kind of just want to start the conversation with the uh, consumers about. The future, um, and that you know, I'm curious. I gotta sit here and watch. Do they like you know? Are they putting in fake noise uh, speakers to generate sounds that everyone is you know? I know one of the big things. I'm not a motorcycle guy, but the particular sound of your motorcycle identifies you as a certain type of rider, and uh, maybe silence will be a new will be the new mantra. I doubt it. Um, but uh, anyway, for not being a motorcycle guy, um, technology is awesome, and it, it looks good. It looks like a good motorcycle. It looks pretty. I don't know if it's your your typical uh, Harley, your actual, your real hardcore uh, enthu uh, Harley Davis enthusiast will like it, but, um, you know, whether you like it or not, um, electric vehicles... I think they're going to be the future. I, I think, you know, they're just talking about the hydrogen fuel cell. But I think at this point, I, if, if I were to bet money, um, I would bet it on electric vehicles. So, anyway. And it looks like Harley Davidson um, is hedging that way as well. So, check out. There's some really nice pictures of the bike. It's, uh, let's see here. They, what did they say? It's called the Live Wire. First ever electric vehicle. Here's what the Live Wire. They call it Project Live Wire. So whether or not that's the the name of the what the motorcycle will be, that's the name of the of the project they're working on. All right. So next story up. Um, HP seems to be capitalizing, capitalizing finally on the mem mem rister technology. So we talked about this many many episodes ago. The the idea of the memory resistor, the idea that uh, a resistor, um, basically a device that can change its its resistance based on previous uh, application of of the current going through, um, creates a um, memory device that doesn't need to have power applied to maintain um, the, uh, the, the, the memory. The, you know, is it a one or a zero? Um, so if you don't know anything about um, you know, random access memory today uh, in your computer, that it, it, it's volatile, which means as soon as the power goes away, boom, um, uh, I, I lose it. Um, specifically, you know, and and in and, and dynamic RAM, I've got a DRAM. You've got to constantly be rewriting the the content of the cells back into it, um, um, or else it, the 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 storage, the one or the zero, fades. And you do that, you know, millions of times per second. So um, anyway, so there was you know, there's these four fundamental uh, components. 
passive components of, in electronics. There's the resistor, the capacitor, the inductor. Well, if you imagine a quad, there's then there's always been this theorized this fourth object that, like a resistor, um, or looking at a capacitor, you know, a capacitor can store charge, and you you rip it out of the circuit, it still contains some charge. Well, you take, pull a mem resistor, mem resistor, mem resistor, out of a circuit, um, it remembers the the current that was going through it, and therefore it's altered by its altered state uh, of its resistance, and you can measure the resistance and figure out um, storage. So basically, anyway, long story short, um, HP has built what's called the machine, a great name that combines basically is is taking that technology and producing a uh, a computer that's capable and they're kind of gearing it towards the Internet of Things. How do you deal with this just absolutely massive amount of data that's going to be coming in the future with all these circuits and all these sensors everywhere? Um, and it's a, a pretty it's a new basically a new it's a new type of computer. It's a new architecture, and um, so you know, basically, for us, you know, since you know the computer has existed in its current state, everyone's heard the von Neumann architecture, and that's conceptually, you know, the CPU, the memory, and the heart, you know, the storage, um, and then the some of the details of the inside insides of a CPU, um, fundamentally. Has not changed. Yeah, we've added we've added new things like we add multiple cores, we add um, memory closer to the CPU, and in, in you know, in terms of cache. But fundamentally, the architectures remain the same. This changes that, and uh, the machine. Um, there's saying here that it is um, six times more powerful than existing servers, and requires eight times the energy. Now, what does that mean? So, it, using eight times less energy. Got that, but what does it mean to to sit there and say you're six times more powerful than existing servers? Well, the machine can manage 160 petabytes of data in 250 nanoseconds. So, right now everyone is used to you can buy the one terabyte hard drive or a two terabyte hard drive. Um, that's kind of like the big boys in the consumer grade kind of world. Well, if a thousand gigabytes is one terabyte, then one thousand terabytes is one petabyte, and therefore, 160 petabytes is 1600. I did my math right. 1600 um, uh, terabytes. So basically, a lot of data, lots of ones and zeros, and in 250 nanoseconds, so a fraction of a second, um, and Basically, the technology is, at least according to the article, and again, we aren't at the point of having a consumer-grade product using this technology yet. Um, and, and God knows that technology can sometimes be over-promised. Um, uh, but, you know, while it's, it's huge for smart you know, supercomputers, um, they also talk about that it can be used. Eventually, this technology can get scaled down, and it wouldn't it, it wouldn't be um, unfathomable to say that within a few years you could have smartphones that have 100 terabytes of memory, 100 terabytes of memory in a smartphone. And remember, today as a consumer, if I go to my local Best Buy, um, I'm lucky to buy I want to say two and a half, maybe three terabytes. I haven't been there in a while, but you know, one or two terabytes in a big old honking external hard drive versus in a few years a hundred terabytes um, in your smartphone. Again, exponential growth. The power of exponential growth in technology. So HP hopes to have some samples available of, this, of the machine in uh, 2015 and um, they then expect the first, you know, actually devices. Now whether they're consumer grade or whether they're business grade uh, devices um, they anticipate those will start shipping um, sometime in the 2018 time frame. Uh, all right, so speaking of energy and transportation, let's combine some of that. So there's a, um, a project going on over in Europe uh, that with um, electric buses um, that basically at each, it looks like at each uh, um, 
stop, a train stop, or at least at every intersection, but I'm guessing that every train stop, that the bus can get topped off in 15 seconds, which is, they say, is about as long as it takes typically for customers to uh, exit and onboard the bus. Um, and uh, it's Geneva, Switzerland is where they're testing out the, the TOSA, the Trolley Bus Optimization System Elimination. I think that's actually supposed to be French. Um, but anyway, um, again, going back to the, the Tesla patents and, and battery charging, um, this is, you know, again, why I, if I put my money on where the future of, of vehicles um, and don't go to the bank with this, but, you know, my personal money would be um, on electric vehicles. Um, so they're, right now they're doing a proof of concept, and they say Geneva is the first city expected to adopt a TOSA bus line as part of its regular service sometime in the 2017 time frame. So somewhere in the next, basically, three years. Um, pretty cool. I will end my rant there. All right, so... Uh, next two stories are on Google, and they're uh, opening their checkbooks and writing some checks to acquire some big, uh, big companies. So they acquired Skybox Imaging, a uh, satellite imaging company, um, for 500 million bucks. Um, obviously, satellite technology, mapping technology is great for things like Google Maps. Um, I'm assuming that means they could do faster updates to maps. Uh, that's probably what they're trying to get towards. Um, the article also talks about the possibility of wireless internet in places that are without service using the satellites as technology. And we all know that you know they've been buying between them and Facebook have been buying out satellite drone companies and whatnot um, to provide internet. Because um, I think you know I think these companies I think the the really big guys the the Googles the Facebooks. Um, to a lesser extent, the Apple, Yahoo, Microsoft, but I think the two big guys here, and maybe even Amazon I throw in there, um, you know, what's going to kill real innovation and adoption is is the Verizons, the AT&Ts, the Comcasts, who have a vested interest solely in controlling the pipe and charging consumers for the pipe, whereas these other guys have more interest in, <laughs> in not having any restrictions in the pipe. So I think what you're seeing here is the beginning of a of a of a ground war or a sky war or an air war, um, depending on your point of view, um, to to rip the control of the pipes. So you know we have telephone companies today, and we have cable internet companies, and we have cable television companies, and we've got our wireless providers. But at the end of the day, um, we as consumers are slowly winning ourselves off. We don't. You know, we don't have telephone service. We don't have internet service. We don't have TV service. For us, especially the younger folks, it's one pipe. We just care about access to the internet, and everything else is take is just simply an app that rides on top of it. So voicemails, you know, voice calling, video calling, text messaging, you know, all that. You know, we don't buy separate services. We want to have just one one connection, always on. Um, and not restricted or constricted in any manner, simply to appease uh, shareholders and trying to get bigger and bigger uh, returns every quarter. So I think what we're seeing here is the beginning of that of that war, and I think it'll probably play out in sometime in the next five years um, a, a real real war between the Comcast, Verizon's, AT and T's, Time Warner's, and the Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons of the world. We'll see if I'm right. Uh, so, uh, as we also talked about, um, I don't have the article. Maybe I'll put it in the show notes. But Google, you know, recently it, they acquired um, Nest, the makers of the really cool uh, thermostat. Uh, you know, in the beginning of the Internet of Things kind of thing, home automation. Um, they Nest and Google just the other day bought uh, DropCam. So obviously, in my mind, it's going towards home security camera systems. Um, but you know, as much as I love Google, and I think Google does great things, and I don't think they are evil that a lot of people try to you know make them out to be. Um, even with all that love I have for them, I still think competition's a good thing. 
keeps everyone honest, well, tries to keep everyone honest, at least if nothing else that keeps people in the toe. So Honeywell, which is a name in the thermostat industry uh, and other um, you know, controls, electronics controls systems, um, should be no stranger to if you're in that world. Well, they're finally uh, releasing a challenger to the Nest thermostat that um, I'm guessing is not as sexy um, in terms of user interface, um, but looks kind of like the Nest. Um, and um, it's let's see, it's it's to 279 bucks, so you know, not as it's it's about comparable. Um, they're saying right now it's only available to purchase through HVAC contractors, but it'll be available at Lowe's by August. Um, again, killing the middleman kind of thing, which is another cool thing. Um, anyway, there's a lot more of the story. Uh, they call it the Lyric. Um, you know, the kind of you can tell. I think they've hired some people that are in the from the Google, Apple, Nest kind of world because they talk about you know it's not just a thermostat. It's Lyric is a platform, and people understanding that. Um, you know, I think no one's really you know home automation has. If you've been if you're very very wealthy, you can make it work. There's a lot of proprietary, but you you. Proprietary components, very expensive because you're locked in. Um, the flip side, you could argue, is that, well, that's true, but there's also been no way to get an industry standard to agree on any, and then we can agree, and therefore, of course, things are proprietary because nobody wants to concede. Um, hopefully, with, you know, the idea, I think, with having the smartphone and being able to control things, I think that's going to force be the forcing function to standards. Um, that it has to be TCP IP enabled, it has to be over the internet. Um, I think that we're going to start seeing then forcing into the higher level protocols to actually make true integration um, a reality. Um, maybe I'm being overly optimistic, but um, at least there's competition. At least we're not static. At least we can buy something that looks a lot better than the ugly thermostats we all have today. All right. Um, man, I'm catching up for lost time here. Three weeks off is a lot. Um, so the FAA, um, about, let's see, about a week and two weeks ago now, a um, little less, uh, approved the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration here in the U.S., approved the first commercial drone use. Um, so basically, uh, the oil company British Petroleum, BP, um, has partnered with a drone manufacturer known as Aerovironment. Um, we got to get better with those names. Um, to launch a, uh, a drone, basically one that's that's been used by the Navy. Um, I'm aware of it, called the Puma. Um, it's a um, so basically it's 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 man man launchable five feet by nine with a nine foot nine feet long with a nine feet nine foot wingspan, um, and it's going to be up there in uh, used up in Alaska to um, uh, patrol the BP's um, oil pipelines. They will also, during that time, do some 3D mapping, wildlife monitoring, and the occasional search and rescue mission. So for those of us that were a little scared that, you know, the uh, FAA was, um, you know, never going to ever allow drones, which I don't even call them drones. I mean, yes, you know, they're unmanned systems, you know, but, you know, they're not much bigger, different than you know, remote-controlled helicopters of, you know, that or remote-controlled aircraft today. Yeah, and there's some autonomous, but there's still people behind it. Um, and in, in my opinion, if it's good, if it's good enough for our military, you know, um, I'm sure we can figure out how to to use them here smartly, um, stateside. But so this is it's a good first step. Um, there is now an, an approved commercial use of uh, 
I hate using the word drone because it's one of those things where it's gotten a negative turn. Unmanned ve- aerial vehicles is what I prefer. Not that's a mouthful. It's not as sexy to say as drones, but uh, there you go. All right, uh, let's see here. This is a, this one. I wasn't. I was just going to read this article for my own personal interest, and then it actually turned out to be pretty interesting. So. Um, uh, Virgin Airlines, Virgin Atlantic specifically, I guess, um, has found a way to save millions of bucks simply by redesigning and reusing, repurposing their um, uh, their meal trays. The you know the tray you get when you you know not when you're flying here domestically, but if you've ever flown uh, internationally, you know you still actually do get a meal on the flight. Um, and by sitting there and looking at the the, the meal trays, um, they figured out a way to make them smaller, more efficient, uh, even the even the utensils. And basically, um, <laughs> here's the thing: they spent 168 million dollars on this on this effort, um, but they. Um, and they made some other changes that make it more useful to the flight attendants, more uh, quicker, easier to use, and whatnot. But um, somewhere here it talks about it says basically um, it, it takes out like 50 or 60 pounds per flight. Yeah, 53 pounds. So the the plane starting out will be 53 pounds lighter. But you know, you're like, well, that doesn't really, huh? But when you do the math and um, you know they can you know use each cart holds more food therefore fewer carts then you start adding all that up um, you're starting to talk you're saving millions of bucks over a year in flight and eventually um, you recoup your your initial costs so anyway I like I said I didn't want to originally include it I was just going to read this for fun but it shows you that you know even little things in design and engineering can add up to have a uh, big consequence. So if you're starting off in your career and you, you feel like you've got, you've been tapped with like, you know, oh, this is the stupid assignment or this is the small assignment, no one cares about this. Um, it, it can, it can be huge. So take every, take every assignment um, seriously and uh, put forth your best effort. All right, off the soapbox. All right, uh, last story. Uh, comes from the Financial Times and is a um, uh, company uh, out in China has a construction firm is uh, mastered a system that is printing out ten houses a day in Shanghai, um, and these are decent size. I think they're let's see, are two thousand square meter homes. I think that's roughly. Um, 2,000 square feet. Yeah, 2,000 square feet. Homes, yeah, if I do the math correctly. Um, so, again, not, you know, this is not necessarily new technology. Um, but the interesting thing is, um, you know, I guess, you know, like any, any new technology over time, um, you know, there's the, 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 the first iteration, people kind of poo-poo it because it's not as efficient, not as cheap as the current stuff. You know, but you iterate, you design, um, and eventually uh, you, you, hit a, you hit an inflection point where the new stuff is becomes more viable, uh, cheaper. Um, and so here's the interesting thing here. That I the reason I included is not only the ten houses a day is that each house and again this is kind of like you know saying that um, you know it's not the whole house it's basically building the 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 structure itself you still got to go in and I'm assuming you, you still got to outfit with the electrical and the lights and um, you know the finishings but just the the shell of the house itself costs about three thousand pounds. Which let's see here. If I say, I think that would be what three thousand. Let me 
Let's see here. 3,000 British pounds is 5,100 US dollars. So I don't know about you, but I did not spend $5,100 for my house. And again, you got I know you got to go back in and add the plumbing and the electrical and the, the the kitchen. So yeah, it's not you know this isn't like fifty one hundred dollars is the whole house. But when you think of time, and in construction, um, time is the money, um, time and materials basically. Um, having a crew here, you know, look how basically if you look if you if you've had your house built. Recently, you know, you'll see um, basically building, putting up the walls, pouring the foundation, putting on the roof. That's what takes longest. Once to get the, that house enclosed, um, you know, after that, things fly. So if I can reduce the time up front to actually build kind of the house. And here's now, now you get to the point where you can actually, I would imagine, pre-build homes. So I can, I can build homes, print them out. Let them sit, let them cure, whatever, um, and then, and if I do this in a in a modular fashion and make them enter like kind of like Legos, interchangeable parts, I can print out all the different parts of the house, sit them in my uh, in, in inventory, and um, then just as you want a different components, pick and choose. I put them in the back of a big old semi, and I I ship them to wherever. Um, or the other thing is that if once you know, like anything, you know, I think eventually you'll have you'll have these special shops that do the printing of the stuff. But eventually, um, the prime contractors themselves, or someone in the in that world, they'll have the printers themselves on site. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how this technology will work out, but I do know it will work out, and I hope, um, hopefully, that will revolutionize. Um, you know, sadly, I think the um, if 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 history holds true, I think there will be a stigma about the houses here in the U.S. People won't want them. You won't one of those. You won't one of those 3D printed houses because I'm assuming um, there will be some restrictions. That maybe the houses have to be smaller. Um, I'm not sure if they, if you put rebar in the house as it's being printed, but um, certainly <laughs> for the uh, developing world. Um, this is huge. Um, third world countries housing, huge. Instead of giving them tents, print out a house. A lot more sustainable, a lot more uh, tolerant to, um, you know, upkeep and environmental. It's huge. Anyway, all right. So I droned on longer than I wanted to today, but I wanted to catch up because there were so many good stories. Um, so that's it. That's all my stories. I promise I will shut up. Um, again, uh, head on over to uh, audibletrial.com slash steampowerpodcast. Um, sign up for an Audible trial, free for 30 days. Cancel before then. Keep the book uh, that you get. You get one free credit, which is basically one free book. Um, also, if you want, curious about the Charger Doctor, if you're a DIY, a maker, um, I get no kickback on any of this. Head on over to adafruit.com. Um, I think it's really valuable when you're when you're trying to see health. Figure out you've built the circuit, you've built something with an Arduino, and you're going to hook it up to a battery source, and you want to know how long that battery source is going to run. This will help you kind of do some uh, back of the napkin nap back of the napkin computation and figure out how long um, will your battery last based on the current draw of your circuit. And so with that, um, I'm trying to think of anything else. Um, next weekend is field day for, so for the ham radio operators of the world. Um, get out and out, set up. I think the biggest thing you can do um, is to set up a get on the air station. So even if you're not going to be a, if you're not a member of a big ham club and you're not going to go out and, and join the huge crowds, uh, relatively speaking, of course, um, even though I think ham radio had its big, this past year was the biggest year in terms of new, new hams licensed. Um, 
but anyway, so um, like I'm going to do, I'm going to go down to, so my county, we have a decent sized amateur radio club, but I'm not really involved with it too much, but I am uh, trying to get more involved with my uh, local maker space. So uh, I have volunteered to take my little Yesu 897 and my buddy pole system and head on down to our local maker space, and I'm going to set up... Um, Basically, I get on the air station um, and sit there from about 1 p.m. on Saturday. So I think it goes, field day itself, the competition lasts from Saturday the 28th at 1 p.m. until Sunday the 29th at 4 p.m. Um, I don't think, unless there's a huge turnout, I'm probably not going to stay the whole time, but I'll be there uh, most of the day and into the early evening on Saturday. And I would encourage anybody else that's, you know, if you're a maker, you're a ham, um, if you can provide some sort of service like that, do it. If you're um, curious about ham radio, um, I'll put a link up in the show notes to the ARR, American Radio Relay League, ARRL website where you can put in your zip code and you can find out um, where, uh, if there's going to be any sort of, um, field day activities in your neck of the woods. So if you're interested in ham radio, it's a great opportunity to get out there, see ham radio in action, and actually get on the air. Um, most of them should have get, get on the air stations, go to stations, where you can sit there and actually pick up the, the mic and speak onto the radio. Um, and, you know, like I said, it's, uh, if I've ranted before about in the past, uh, ham radio is definitely changing. Uh, Software-defined radios, um, uh, digital transmission modes, um, and you don't have to know Morse code anymore to get a license all the way up. And in the U.S., there's three classes of license, uh, technician, general, and uh, extra. Um, as of a few years ago, you now don't need to know Morse code to get a license in any of them. It's still good to know. Um, I would like to learn Morse code. Um, I'm just not a very good at, as my wife would say, I'm not very good at listening. So um, for me, it's a little hard to pick out the dits and dots. I know a lot of people say that you got to kind of, instead of listening for each individual dit and dot, um, basically, you know, the, the dot or a, a stroke, um, you got to kind of hear it together as like a word. Kind of like you don't hear each individual letter in a word. You hear the word together. Um Still, for me, someone who has like zero musical talent, I can't do that. Um, but I want to try. Anyway, that's enough. Uh, head on over. So, if you want to follow me, I'm on Twitter at MB Parks. Um, if you want to follow along, we're at SteamPowerPodcast.com. Has links to everything. Um, you can also follow along on Google at. Uh, google.com slash plus steam power podcast and um, yeah if you got any ideas uh, you know any any cool stories um, set up a link hit up a post something there and um, yeah so that's it um, so thank you very much for listening and uh, until next week stay quirky